to say that I'm trying to think. Is there anything Chris we want to say that Avi cannot record on film? <laughs> Nothing springs to mind. Uh, I'm sure if we worked at it, yeah, mm -hmm. we could. Well, look, I want to. Say, well, I will say, but I'll have to say it again on camera how how lovely it is to be here. I actually want to. No, I do want to say this on camera. I want to say why well, I'm particularly thrilled to be doing it with Chris. But I guess what I do want to say that doesn't have to go on camera is that I've done two gigs while I've been in the States this time. This is one, and the other was at the West Hollywood Library about ten nights ago. And some of my very well established writer friends in Australia, and there's at least one person in the audience who might guess who they were, um, were I think literally green with envy because it's hard to think of two more fabulous places to speak than something called the Bureau of General Services Queer Division in New York. <laughs> And the West Hollywood Library, I mean, you know, it refutes the title of my book altogether. Uh, yeah, no, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> We're good to go. I'm We're so sorry. Do we get coloured again? Oh, okay. <laughs> I mean, this is like being Lana Turner in the grocery store. <laughs> <laughs> All right, uh, interview, Mark. So. Start all over again, or did you use what I said before? Start all over again. Okay, well, let me just jump right in and say just how, how much I really love this book. It's uh, it's such an interesting mix of things. I mean, it's uh, it's autobiography. It used autobiography to kind of explore uh, the past 50 years of history, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40 years of history. Uh, and your own kind of changing ideas and uh, expectations that turned out differently. Uh, lots about cultural politics, lots about uh, uh, gay politics. Uh, for me, one of the biggest revelations was a lot about Australia. And it was, uh, you've gone back and forth between the United States and Australia. But I was fascinated to see uh, how things are the same but different there. For me, Australia in the book works like a funhouse mirror, where you see some of the same things from American experience, but the proportions are different. Uh, and uh, the emphasis is different. The time frame is different. Things will be happening sooner or later. Uh, you know what I've always thought about that, is that coming from Australia to the US, it's like that moment in The Wizard of Oz where suddenly it becomes technicolor. <laughs> because everything here is bigger, more exaggerated, uh, more extreme. And more extreme in both good and bad ways. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but, and, but, that, but this is ours instead of Australia. Exactly, <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Can I just say how I'm really, really thrilled to be here with Chris Brown. One is because I really like his books. But more, there's also a, a sort of more generic reason. Um, I'm a, by profession, I work in social sciences, and as Chris knows, I've had a huge involvement with international aids work, where novelists are not regarded as in any form serious commentators. And my feeling, knowing Chris's work, is that you actually do better ethnography and better history than a lot of people whom universities employ to do those things. And so for me, speaking with a novelist, although you, your most recent book is not a novelist, well, it's a novelist book, but it's, it's non-fiction, is actually very exciting, and I wanted to put that on record. Oh, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> well, I confess that when, when I agreed to do a conversation with you, I prayed to you, but I was thinking, oh, but... Dennis is a thinker. He thinks in these uh, big ideas, and I'm I'm a novelist, and I'm thinking in little specifics. But then reading your book, you think in specifics too, and then you're working in with the ideas and questions. And it's um, you're a very flexible writer. I mean, there's no uh, things are like this. Uh, I mean, the question mark at that at the end of the title is there for a good reason. And of course it. And I'm going to have my moment of nostalgia because there are three or four people in this room who I have known for over 40 years. In fact, there are people in this room who and we've known each other going back to the origins of the Gay Liberation Front in New York. The title really came from my very first book. And this is not the original edition. It's one I happened to find at 
the famous circus of books in Los Angeles, <laughs> which has been immortalized by David Levitt discussing cruising in the um, back rooms of the circus of books. And I found this, and I've realized there is an enormous sense in which when I wrote this book, I, like a lot of young radicals in the movement, really thought things would work differently. And as Chris said, the question mark is really a reference back. The last chapter of my first book was called The End of the Homosexual. And I always regretted we didn't make that the title of the first book. So I had to wait 40 years to actually write the book that I probably wanted to have written then. Mm, well, I couldn't, yeah. of course. No, you could, yeah. yeah. But um, it deliberately does pick up from that first book. Yeah. No, I mean, one of the things fascinating things is just that and it's kind of like the framing device in that you introduce a question at the beginning of the new book and at the end, but just how it picks up on, you're dealing with something we've been talking about now for 40 years. Yeah. We, we thought, okay, when we arrive, when everything is good, uh, we won't be a separate identity anymore. But now the question is, is that really what we want? Uh, and just kind of want to talk about that a little bit. What, what were your, yeah. what, how have your feelings changed over the years? But, I actually want both, oh, you know? yeah. and I think, I think most of us want both, and Chris has given me permission to be Australian, and this, is, you know, this is actually quite important because when I've talked about this book in Australia, which I did a lot last year, the example I often fell back on was our former finance minister, who is a first generation Asian Australian openly lesbian woman living with her partner and they have two kids. And the point is that even 20 years ago, certainly 30 or 40 years ago, it would have been inconceivable for someone like that to hold one of the most senior government positions in the country. Now, of course, there are lots of American examples like that. I'm you know, being deliberately bringing in Australia. But I think that in that sense, it has become possible. It is possible now to be open about your sexuality, but for that to not define you. Mm -hmm. You can do other things with it. And that, to me, is the most important success. But, of course, that is true for a minority of the world. And as Chris knows, I mean, I am very preoccupied with the global debates, and in most parts of the world that is certainly not the case. Yeah. And, and that is something we have to keep remembering. And, you know, I, again, I got attacked a week ago in Los Angeles for being deeply anti-American, um, and you will undoubtedly attack me for that, but I had been in West Hollywood during their Pride Festival, or the beginning of the Pride Week. And, you know, to be honest, there is this air of triumphalism that doesn't sit well with you know, mm -hmm. We've done it. We've achieved it. Isn't it wonderful? We're, everyone loves us. We're so respectable. Mm -hmm. I'm uneasy with that. Firstly, I think for a lot of people in this country, it's not true. And globally, it's certainly not true. Mm -hmm. But I should perhaps ask you, I mean, do you have the same ambiguity I do, that you want both to have this sense we're part of a community, but also that there are moments when that's not what you want to be defined by? Uh, yeah, I, ambi I, I, I kind of ambivalent feel. I, yeah, I want both. Also, I sometimes wonder there's that feeling of community can be kind of elusive. Is it real or not? And then, and then there'll be moments where you think, oh, it is real. Oh, good. That's. Uh, but it's not. Uh, it's not like this permanent plug. It's it's very slippery. It's very flexible, uh, which is good. I mean, it's because we we are multiple. Each person is multiple identities. So there's not. Uh, just a shot. Oh, I'm sorry. Oh. Okay. Sorry, there's a technical hitch because I've unhooked my... Your, your nipple <laughs> has done <laughs> this. <laughs> no, I think if I had nipple rings, life would be a lot easier. <laughs> because we could have slipped the mic through the ring. But I know. Right. Just pull your shirt over it, that's all. Ah, you don't want to see it. We will preserve the illusion. Okay. Okay, no, no, I like this. This is this is the sort of live action moment in the video. <laughs> Sorry, everybody. This is really unexpected. I'm not having a good day today, as you can all see. Oh. Yeah, but we, we forgive you. It's okay. 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 Uh, let's, 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 let's.
if it helps, I will tell you that I once interviewed an almost very famous rock star with a tape recorder. It's a long time ago, right, when we used tape recorders. <laughs> and after 30 minutes, oh. yeah, I realised I was <laughs> not on. Oh. 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 So, I feel, for, <laughs> I feel for the cameraman. Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> but, but that, I mean that the, uh, yeah, you want both. Yeah. But that, but the, the community, identity, communities, what it's, that's a slippery thing too, which is which is good. I mean, that's uh... look. I know it's become very, it's become very fashionable to say, oh, we don't have communities like we used to. Mm -hmm. It's often um, a grumble I hear from people of our generation. I can only talk about it from my own experiences, which extend, you know, to a number of parts of the world. I feel if we think about tonight, we are in a space that I feel is different to, and I don't remember anymore which bookshops still exist in New York. I mean, I know we couldn't be doing this in Barnes and Noble at Ashton Place, uh, because nobody could be doing it right in Barnes and Noble at Ashton Place. Place. Yeah. Right. Yeah. But I think there is a sense, and I actually think that my own personal life, <laughs> well, you know, and I need to tell people this, my partner of 22 years died about 14 or 15 months ago, and that sort of defines very much my world. And since Anthony died, I have found a lot of comfort and support from what I'd call a community, mm -hmm. and often from much younger people, which I find really important to stress, because part of the nostalgia that goes on is to say, oh, they don't have a sense of community like we used to. Mm -hmm. And there is a rewriting, I think, of history that... Um, is often, I think, unfair to much younger people. Yeah. And a bit self-indulgent. Yeah. No, I mean, it's often talked about, like, back in the 70s, mm -hmm. we were like one big happy family. Yeah. And, no, we weren't. <laughs> uh, and there are people who just didn't understand what was right. going on and couldn't care less. Right. There are others who are at each other's throats arguing politically. It was very, it, yeah, that, well, it is a myth. Absolutely. Uh, There's that wonderful moment in the documentary about Vito Russo where a gay pride, probably most of you have seen it, there's a moment where a gay pride event in New York is almost destroyed by that sort of the, the fight, swapping. The fight outside the Washington, yeah. Washington Square. Yeah. yeah, yeah. But I think also... I mean, the other thing that comes into the discussion of community is I think there are, there's clearly a whole question around gender and class, and in this country, and in my country, race and ethnicity. I mean, it becomes complicated, but there's also, I think, for us, and you know, I'm now speaking for people like Chris and myself, who were part of a pre-HIV community, the scars of the epidemic all the people who should be growing older with us who are not here is very, very real. And I think of it as our world, and I, I'm speaking to a number of you who I know share this, our world has been hollowed out. And that is something that I don't think we've yet really found. I mean, it's really interesting because you want to think you wrote one of the early novels responding to the epidemic. So Angel Claire would have been yeah. late 80s? Uh, 89. Yeah. 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 And there were a whole series of really quite powerful books that appeared, particularly here, but you know, also elsewhere. Mm -hmm. um, I can think of an Australian one. Um, I can think of quite a few in France. That sort of... That was a very fertile period. But I think now our generation needs to come to terms with something different, which is we are aging in a world that is emptier than it ought to be. Uh, does that make yeah, sense to you? That makes sense. Yeah, that does make sense. It's, uh... Although it is, I mean, it's only recently I think we now can talk about that past, mm -hmm. talk about what was lost, talk about the, uh, I mean, that uh, kind of I mean, explore with, with recent films, with finally yeah. Normal Heart getting made. It's just, and it's kind of like, now it's safe to make it. Now it's safe to think about yes. it. And I think, I think there's going to be good stuff coming out of that, too. So that, but it's take, it takes a while. It's like, uh, I write a lot and read a lot of war fiction. And usually mm -hmm. it's not right at the time. It takes yeah. like 
20 years later, the really interesting war novels are written. That people, it's still too raw, they don't want to talk about it. And I think that's, that's true with AIDS. Um, I, don't, I, was, I actually just wanted to tell a story, which I'm, I'm not going to say very much that's in the book because then you will feel cheated when you buy your seven copies. Um, <laughs> but there's a lovely story that actually, I think, helps us with this discussion because it's not just a gay male experience. Many, many years ago, I was with this extraordinary woman, Noreen Kaliba, who is one of the founders of the community response to the epidemic in Uganda. And this is in a period when we didn't think of Uganda quite as we think of it now. We knew that Uganda was an epicenter of a pandemic. And Noreen said she had just been to San Francisco and that walking around San Francisco felt to her like walking around the villages in Uganda. She got the parallel. Mm -hmm. And I, what I remember very vividly in San Francisco, visiting there in the 90s, which was when I, you know, coming from Australia, you still came here and you bought, you were very excited. There were books we didn't have and there were CDs we didn't have. Now, of course, they're all online. And, it doesn't have the same thrill, but what I suddenly had this horrible recognition. There was so much stuff that was being sold in second-hand shops because the people had died. Yeah, yeah. You know, mm -hmm. um, and I think you're right. There's now a revisiting of it, but okay. Can I say my troubles me about the revisiting? Okay. Yeah. The revisiting is not reminding people that there is a global epidemic being dealt with in countries that however bad, and you know, let's not get into a whole long tirade about the iniquities of Reagan, we all know about the iniquities of Reagan, and if you didn't, take Clinton told you on Monday night, more often than we needed to hear, but most people in the world who are dealing with this epidemic have none of the resources, either political or financial, that we have. And what worries me is that we're hearing story after story, which is rehearsing the same ground. Yeah, yeah. Well, and the problem with revisiting now, we're talking about, talking about is if it's over. Yes. It might be over yes. for us, but it's not over in the rest of the world. Yeah. And of course, it isn't over here. Right. I mean, there are... When I was in Washington for the last International AIDS Conference, there were Americans who, who were explaining how tough it was to get necessary therapies. Mm -hmm. So even in this yeah. country, it's yeah. not over. No, no. Um, and we don't want to have a whole discussion about AIDS, but I think, you know, that of course, in a horrible way, that's the thing that none of us could have predicted. Mm -hmm. you know? Maybe, Chris, we should go back to the fact, because you and I come out of that, I think, really interesting moment in New York, when I lived here and you lived here, and that wasn't what made, well, of course that's, that's what made it interesting, yeah. and Ed Posh never understood that bit, right? <laughs> um, <laughs> no, it was the, that was the moment of a sort of, sudden bursting out of gay writing, gay literary and intellectual life, right? And, and Chris and I are not quite sure if we know each other, but we almost certainly were at Christopher Street magazine, New York native street parties at the well, same time. Well, we first met because at Christopher Street I reviewed Patrick White's The Tribal Affair. That's Care, right. And you wanted to meet me when we met. And that was, so it's the Australian Connection and <clears throat> Christopher Street oh, magazine. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yes. So, yeah. And it was we both wrote for Christopher Street. And we both wrote yeah. for Christopher Street, yeah. yeah. But yeah, it was kind of like that suddenly you could write about, mm -hmm. tell gay stories, right? Write about, write gay criticism, all of this. Yeah. Suddenly it was exciting. And it was, uh, it was a monthly magazine, Christopher Street, uh, was, uh, which was like starting in like 76, December 76 is the first issue. Oh, really? And, uh, and they, were aimed, they wanted to be the gay New Yorker. Uh, yeah. And and now and then some there's some terrific stuff yeah. appeared in that magazine. A lot of good things that then became books. And I'm actually because I want to say something else about why I was really thrilled to be doing this with Chris, and that is that among gay writers, what I've always liked about your work is that you've taken the gay experience and then gone out of it to talk about a lot of big political and historical events that are not only about people's sexuality. And I really admire that. I mean, you know, there's something, as I said at the beginning, I was quite sincere, I have been struggling 
for many years to get the AIDS world to understand the importance of the creative and the imaginary. And I think that you've done that. And you know, I've, as someone, you know, I've taught at my job, my, my bread and butter job for a very long time was to teach American politics to Australians, which is a fabulous gig, let me tell you, because they all think they know everything about it, and of course they don't. Um, but I think that I have learnt a lot. You know, I can think of moments that when you're going back to World War II, you're going back, well, I think in one case, even to the Civil War, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, that's, that's very interesting. And so being here with you, I'm not quite serious. It's, um, I think there's a real problem, I'm going to segue from that, to what I think yeah. is now an enormous problem in our world, and I'm deliberately avoiding any alphabetic acronyms, mm -hmm. because they will have changed in the 10 minutes between being on the street and being in here anyway. Um, I think the biggest problem now is super specialization. And I find that people who, for example, are busy querying Jane Austen, whom I think, you know, did it quite successfully herself, <laughs> um, and people who are worrying about the latest debates about prayer, literally do not read each other, they do not talk to each other, they, they don't even know of each other's existence. You and I come out of that time when we sort of could read everything. Right? I mean, there well, wasn't that, there much. Wasn't that much. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Uh -huh. yeah. And I think, and there are connections that we were exploring at breakfast between the people both of us have written about and both of us have been influenced by. But I suspect it would be very hard for people 30 years younger to have that sense of common queer heritage because it's now so diverse and so big. No, we would read, there's nobody else to read, so that we would kind of, well, no, I was delighted to find out that these people I wrote about in Eminent Outlaws, uh, James Baldwin and Christopher Isher, and of course, Cora Vidal, you knew, you, you met, you not only read them, you met them too. And I can be Australian again. <laughs> I did actually say to the guys before, you know, the irony is that here are these three great icons, right? Isherwood, Baldwin, Vidal. The reason I knew them in all three cases, so I thought about it after we'd had breakfast, is because I am not American and I didn't live here. So, Baldwin I met because the Australian Broadcasting Commission put us together in a conversation. And I was sitting in a radio studio in Sydney petrified because, to be honest, he was the one I had most awe of. And we had a 40 minute discussion on Australian radio. There's no way I would have been given that opportunity here. Mm -hmm. And then I subsequently went and visited him. Um, Isherwood, I met here, but then he came to Australia with Don Bacardi and I looked after them for a couple of days. Again, I can't imagine that would have happened to me here. And Gore, who is the one I knew much the best. Um, and you did a whole book about Gore. And I did a whole book about Gore. Which was a great mistake. I mean, I liked doing it, but it was a great mistake. You should never write a warning to all young authors. Do not write about authors who write hugely about themselves. <laughs> <laughs> On the other hand... Especially I, when they're still alive. Well, <laughs> and, and I have many stories. And I, you know, I take some pride in the fact that in his second and, you know, unfortunately not very good memoirs, he devotes two entire chapters to telling people what I got wrong. Um, but... But I met Gore because, a very long time ago, about the time that Gaylord was starting actually, Australian Customs seized my copy of Myra Breckenridge when I was coming back to Australia. And because at that stage we had a properly upright and morally correct government who you know, wanted to protect us from American filth. <laughs> and it became a test case. It actually is one of a number of cases and effectively Australia ended that sort of book censorship very quickly but um, again a tip for young authors if you admire someone who's older and established try and go to court on their behalf <laughs> a beautiful friendship is almost guaranteed <laughs> you can't do it here because of course 
this is through customs, and, and on the whole, Americans don't need to import books. But I think it's uh, or alas, they don't import books. That's the well, yeah. Yeah. So. But I think actually there were books that were published, weren't there, in the yeah. 50s, 60s, 60s, 70s in Paris? Lolita was yeah. first. Uh, the Maurice Gerovius and uh, yeah, that's were, right. And they were seized by customs. Yeah. yeah. So you could yeah. have. Yeah. That's your chance. Yeah. But, um, yeah, I mean, it is sort of, and I really appreciate it when Chris and I had, I mean, I, I, I realised with this book, I struggled for a while to, to know quite how to write this book. I'm very touched by the fact you think it's well structured. In fact, the structure has a lot to do with some of the best editing I've ever come across in my life, which I talk about in the acknowledgements. And I feel genuinely grateful because I know that sort of editing is virtually no longer happening. Mm -hmm. But originally it was going to be a book that I was going to do with the University of Chicago Press because I'd done a previous book, Global Sex, with them. And I couldn't quite get it. And then I suddenly realised, of course I can't get it. I don't live in the States. There are hundreds of people writing about this here. Mm -hmm. But, as you know, the book begins with Australian stories yeah. that you picked up as having a resonance beyond... I, mean, I find this fascinating because an Australian will, of course, read them in a particular way. Mm -hmm. But you're reading them in a particular way, which is very They, they were news to me. I mean, yeah. I, I, although I was also surprised by how many of the names I knew, uh, filmmakers and, uh, and novels. Mm. But, uh, but the politicians, I don't know at all. So, and, and some of the... But yeah, no, it was, it was yeah. news to me. I found it really, really interesting. But then exactly. probably some of the non-Australian and non-Americans are new to you. Because this is a world. I mean, I have Jeffrey Weeks, and most of you probably know of Jeffrey Weeks, the English, and I'll say gay historian, but I mean, that's in a way probably not how I would want to describe him. But Jeffrey is an enormously significant figure in histories and studies of sexuality. And Jeffrey once said to me that I had the knack of being in the right place at the right time. And I think that's, you know, serendipity is important. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, I didn't come to the United States again in the 80s to be here when the epidemic started. I was, but you know, and that has had a huge impact on my life ever since. Um, in the same way, when I first came to New York in the 70s and I met at least three of the people who are here tonight, I didn't come to meet any of you. I mean, if I'd known how charming you were, of course, you know. <laughs> when I applied for leave as a very, very young academic, I would, of course, have said this is, you know, why I should come to New York. But it is love. Mm -hmm. And I, I'm actually interested because I wonder, given the sort of subject matter you've ranged over, how much of it is chance and how much of it is sort of deliberate decision? I think it's a combination of the two. It's, uh, you're prepared, you prepare yourself, and then the chance falls in your life. Uh, I mean, Eminent Outlaws happened, I wasn't planning to write, write it. I was looking for a non-fiction project. And, uh, and a friend of a friend uh, called me up and wanted to pick my brain about gay, gay literature one-on-one. -on -one, about, uh, he, oh, he was doing a book on uh, Breakfast and Tiffany, the movie. But he didn't know anything about the literary history. So I spoke to him for half an hour on the phone uh -huh. and filled him in. And he said, wow, this is great stuff. Where can I read it? And I realized it didn't exist. So it was just, a, and once I started writing it, I thought, this is a book I was, I was meant to write. I've been preparing yeah. to write this ever since I came to New York. Yeah. Uh, so, so yeah, chance has a lot to do with it. It's, but it's interesting, isn't it? Because there are books that somehow you're ready for, I think. Yeah, uh, you're prepared. You're prepared. You're preparing without knowing exactly. it. Exactly, yeah. 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 And then there are books that somehow people push you into doing, and they never quite work, mm -hmm. to be honest. And, and I've had that experience as well. Uh -huh. I suspect, well, maybe it's different for novelists, because I'm not sure you can sustain it. it had, yeah, I, it hasn't happened to me. It's always been something I've wanted to do. If, if when I started, I'd be a little hesitant, I think, uh, and then I'd get into it. Uh, I mean, Angel Clare, interestingly enough, it was, I was going to write a, in another project, my uh, uh, agent said, what do you think about writing next? What about a book of short stories? I said, well, there's this one story I'd like to tell. And I told him the plot, he said, that's not a story, that's a novel, and I want to read that novel. 
And it's because of him that I then sat down and wrote. And he was right. It was, it's not a short story, it's only one. Well, you know, the one book I ever wrote because of an agent was oh, oh. the first book I wrote about AIDS, which was published here as AIDS in the Mind of America, and then published in Britain as AIDS in the New Puritanism, which is probably a better title. Mm -hmm. And it came directly from my agent, who was very friendly with an editor at Doubleday, and they basically took me to lunch. This is the good old days, right? When they were taking the lunch, did, yeah. 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 <laughs> you get a free lunch out of an editor. Oh, more yeah. than that. I mean, if your, if your editor was Michael Denner, you could get weekends on Fire Island. <laughs> <laughs> I think that day is gone, right? Like it, yeah. If you could buy them a coffee. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. And that. But I think non-fiction is different. I mean, non-fiction, somebody, a good editor will say, this is something that should be written, who do I know, mm -hmm. right? A novel can't work like that. Yeah. So did, uh, ultimately, with AIDS in the Mind of America, did, was it a good experience writing it, or was it difficult, or...? No, it was a very good experience mm -hmm. because... I, I think, and you know, to be honest, I almost settled in the United States in the... I mean, I had the bad timing. I, I lived in New York basically through the first Reagan um, administration. And I was about to go home and I met someone and we had a relationship and the lawyer said to me, oh, you know, a couple of thousand dollars, we can fix a green car. This is the virtue of a Republican administration, so you can buy anything. <laughs> and um, I realised I did not want to live as an expat. But I also realised the lovely thing about being in a small country is you can do many things. And I really value that. So mm -hmm. I have different roles. I mean, there's a role that would be irrelevant here when I go on Australian radio and talk about Australian politics mm -hmm. as a professor of politics. And my being gay is not hidden. This actually has come up if that is relevant to the debate, and it usually isn't. Oh. Um, the other thing I think that I really appreciate, that, and I think about it every time I come back to the States, which has been such a central part of my life, when you live in a small country, you're constantly exposed to things from outside the country. So we watch your television programs. Um, we read your publications. We buy your book. Well, no one buys books anymore. You know, they come on Kindle. And my lovely neighbours next door download your television programs for free, but I won't name them because we know what problems that could cause. But it is seriously, in a funny way, when you live on the periphery, you have to be more cosmopolitan. Mm -hmm. And I really like that. Um, and that has also been really important for me in the AIDS world, where it has meant I've know, got to know pe extraordinary people from very, very different parts of the world in a way that I think is hard. Ameri you know, this is not a criticism. This is where I've been misread. I actually understand. And if we were in China today, you'd have to say exactly the same thing. There are huge burdens if you are a citizen of a dominant world power because you may not have any role or support for your current administration, whoever they are, and I suspect most of you until 2008 did. But other people will load you with it, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, we can escape that much more easily because we don't matter. We matter. Yeah, that, 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 yeah, better way to phrase that it's like we don't matter, yeah. But, uh, but no, it's, there's less, uh, less of a burden, less. Uh, Plus of a weight. Well, except and, I think, and, you have, and you're having to look out anyway. I mean, you yeah. are more, uh, I mean, out of necessity, more cosmopolitan. Uh, I mean, I'm of course painting the rosy picture, and you know, were our current prime minister to walk in, he would not. I would not be able to hold him up as a model of cosmopolitanism. <laughs> um, but what 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 I guess it boils down to is. I had to make a choice that all writers from small countries, I think, have to make. And it's, for me, it's extraordinarily exciting, and I'm serious, I'm, I'm now, you know, nothing anti-American at all. 
this is still a center that's important to us. And so doing this sort of conversation, being able to write about experiences that cut across borders, mm -hmm. is terribly interesting. And also just being in New York with this sense of, you know, I feel now like an archaeologist because I've been in and out of this city for 40 years. Yeah. And mm -hmm. I mean, I first came to New York City as a very, very young, three years, four years old graduate student at Cornell. Um, and the changes, you know, when, when you don't live somewhere, the changes. You remember when we were having breakfast yeah. and I was still going to a culture shop? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Um, but it also means you miss things, I think. Mm -hmm. and I'm sure there's a lot that's happened here, which is why I had to write a book that's anchored somewhere else. That's, an, that's anchored in a place you, you really know. I yeah. mean, and you, you uh, know it's your home. Yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah. And home is interesting, isn't it? As one gets older, yeah. I think a sense of home becomes extreme. And you've, ever since I've known you, or even known of you, you've been here. Yeah, no, yeah. I, I think from Virginia same, yeah. and, and came up here in 1978 and been here ever since. And in the same street. And in the same street, yeah. <laughs> and, and with the same partner, too. Uh, yeah, I mean, uh, how does one trump that? <laughs> I'm lucky. Uh, it's again, yeah. going back to chance. I'm lucky, yeah. yeah. But I think, I think most that is possible, I think, for someone who lives in New York or London or Paris or Shanghai, mm -hmm. in a way that I, it wouldn't have been possible for me. You know, I needed to have, I've had eight years of my life in this country where there is, always I point out in blue states. But <laughs> <laughs> I think it would be very difficult not to have had. Yeah. And I think of most of the Australian writers I know. Most of them would have lived elsewhere, mm -hmm. and, and we would do that naturally, I think. I'm looking at Sophie to see if she's going to disagree or agree. You see, we have an Australian writer living in New York at the moment, she's not in a position to disagree. <laughs> well, it's compelled. Well, that's true. Yeah, yeah. That's true. I mean, the, the major role, I don't know if he's still there, but Peter Carey used to live in the West Belt, doesn't mm -hmm. right? This, yeah. A major Australian writer living a few yeah. blocks away yeah. in, exactly. in the West Village yes. in New York. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And very nostalgic for Australia. Always writing about yeah. Australia. Yeah. 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 And of course, because one thing that's lovely when Chris and I met, and you actually knew, you would actually read Australian literature, and you read things I haven't read. Um, I didn't let on. And we talked about Sunderlock Lock Elliot. Oh, yeah. And yeah. I don't know if you guys have um, the reprint of Fairyland in the shop. Um, which Chris will say is not a very good novel, and I will say is an extraordinary piece of historical reconstruction. Would you agree with that? I, I yeah. would agree with that. No, it's yeah, no, it is. It's a very sad, painful, real autobiographical novel. Yeah. I mean, and that yeah. it's yeah. But I think a real interest here because the hero who grows up in Sydney in the thirties, which was a Deeply, deeply puritanical, provincial. You know, this is before aeroplanes, let alone before the internet. So, really <laughs> isolated. He served in the Australian Army, and this is both the character and the author. He was totally taken with a couple of American GIs, um, as were many Australian service people. <laughs> um, and he followed one to the States, which I think is in the novel. Yeah, but I, I, yeah. To be honest, his novel, the novel of life is so quite yeah, it's, 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 yeah. Um, And he settled here, but a bit like Peter, um, everything that he wrote that's good goes back to his childhood in Australia. So he couldn't mm -hmm. get beyond his memories of growing up there. Well, his most famous book is Careful He Might Hear You. And it's a child growing up in Australia. Yeah. That's, yeah. But it's universal. Yeah, yeah. In the way, and I think that's what has been really interesting to me, as I've had more and more contact with people outside the rich world. In fact, I I was looking at my 
shameful admission. I have I find it very hard to reread. Do you find it hard to reread yourself? Yeah. 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 I actually reread some of this because I came down the river to the Hudson today on the on the ferry, which is fabulous. But uh, I had I just missed one, and I was sitting at the pier at Long Island City for half an hour, and I started rereading myself, and I realised how extraordinarily focused this book was on the rich world. But you know, I, every now and then it's I say, oh yeah, well, of course, you know, maybe we should think about, and that's just, and that was of course a reflection of how the gay movement saw. It. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, even knowing what was going on in Paris, where actually they came up with gay live ideas before Stonewall, which is part of our history that has been very carefully obliterated, um, that was a struggle. And I was really, str and the other thing I'm struck by where you or someone in the audience will help, I told you this before, mm -hmm. there's a description of a gay bar in the early 70s in the East Village that I have no memory of. And somebody in this room will probably be able to figure yeah, out. Read, read it out loud. I'm not sure I can yes. find yeah, it, yeah. but um, very early on, because remember this book was written in the early 70s when um, talking openly about uh, gay stuff was, of course, rather different. And so I was, there's, a, there's an early section called Discovering the Gay World, and I, it's actually interesting to me, I, I, I blanched at some of my moralism as a young man. <laughs> uh -huh. I think I actually used the yeah. word disgusting somewhere, where... The, the puritanism of youth, is that... <laughs> There was a horrible moment when I thought Larry Kramer would like this sentence. <laughs> um, okay, so... <laughs> I describe a bar... Okay, two blocks east of the theatre playing O Calcutta, a small bar area in the front, a dance floor behind, jukebox and coloured lights with a platform for occasional drag shows and films. The clientele mix the predominantly young, long-haired, with clothes running to leather fringes and psychedelic colours. Well, that could be anyway. Um, a number of blacks, Harlem slick and with afros. Um, slight hint of marijuana in the air, and some of those dancing are obviously high. A couple of women dance hugging in the middle of the floor. The jukebox features hard rock, soul, and lollipop pop. We could offer a prize. Yes. Yeah. I'll give a prize to the bookshop. They get, they get a copy of a book by me and a copy of a book by Christopher if they can identify the bar and they have to. Was it? Yeah. Which was where? On St. Mark's? No, it was below St. Mark's. Okay. But not far below St. Mark's. And everybody hung out there and it was just like that. <laughs> that, that was just so I got like that. Yeah. Yeah. One of my great memories there was going there, and Allen Ginsberg was there, and Robert Joffrey, and about four other people of that ill in the back. You know, not back in the front of the bar, because you went to the back of the bar. Then. Yeah, it was a great bar. Thank you. Thank you. And now I can do a prize. Yeah. Yeah, sure, sure. Yeah, sure. Yeah, but I never want to be Yeah, so let's open the floor for questions. Anyone? Yes, please. Um, well, thank you uh, for uh, talking tonight. There was, uh, one could make an art, very plausible argument that the beginning of the gay liberation here in New York City had uh, a lot of leftist Roots, you know, a lot of leftist politics going on at the time, and that contributed enormously to the energy and uh, the greatness of the movement here. Uh, is there any kind of a leftist, visible, viable community in Australia in conjunction with gay community, LGBT community, uh, that has oomph and energy at the moment? Okay, I think we're going to have to repeat questions, so I suspect people at the back don't hear. Did, did everybody hear that or not? Oh, they heard it. Yeah, okay, okay. okay. Yeah. Um, look, our 
movement had very similar roots. Um, we had a very major anti-Vietnam movement. We had a significant feminist movement. We didn't, of course, have a civil rights movement in the same way because Indigenous Australians are comparable to Native Americans. We have no former large population descended from slaves. So that element is different. Um, I think, and I'm going to try very hard not to be super nationalist and patriotic, our movement never became as, or took much longer to become respected. <laughs> our movement, I'm deliberately avoiding the term LGBT. I hate the term, you'll have to buy the book to find out. I think it has a whole lot of problems and I don't think we've got time and Chris very wisely avoided a number of questions that he could have asked me which would have been difficult. Um, the connections with the left have probably as here declined. Um, and currently, with a conservative government that is both socially and economically conservative, interestingly, they have just appointed as Human Rights Commissioner an openly gay man who is himself, on economic issues, very cons you know, conservative, meaning a free market rationalist. If you can't make it, you know, it's your fault. You've chosen to be homeless. This being, I think, one of the great statements our Prime Minister once made about people who are homeless. Um, but Tim, interestingly, would probably agree with most of the people in this room on sexual politics. So, I think, it's, I think it is still true. We have, been, we have a less respectable, less wealthy movement but also electoral politics work very differently in Australia. And we also have a significant Greens party, which is a third party that actually does have some clout because they have a number of senators. Um, and the way we do politics is enormously different. In fact, when I was writing the book, I had to keep going back to American examples because some of you will remember Elaine Noble, who was, I think, the first First elected. First elected openly. Lesbian. Lesbian, yeah. well, all gay yeah. politician in, in the country. And um, it took longer in Australia. But again, you know, there are openly queer activists, including the Prime Minister's sister, who's, who is deeply conservative on every issue except her right to marry her girlfriend. <laughs> <laughs> I think Jenison, if you could elaborate a little bit on the fact that um, that fairly conservative position has slightly overwhelmed the gay movement in Australia, that is the right to get married has become the focus for gay politics in Australia. Um, can I just, I, th I think, I mean, Sophie is of course right, and I think what one always has to say, point out when you're in the States, marriage does not bring with it the things that it's associated with here. For a very long time, we have had all sorts of legal and practical recognition of de facto couples, irrespective of gender. So immigration, <coughs> health coverage, hospital visitations, inheritance. I mean, the great irony for me is that you had to go through the Windsor case, right, for that woman to be able to inherit, essentially, from her dead partner, as I understand it. When Anthony died, there was no question that I would get his retirement benefits. And when I asked, well, what are the tax implications? The answer was, there are none because you are his partner. So it's important to understand the marriage debate in Australia is a different debate. It's much more about symbolism. And Sophie and I are among difficult, going back to your question, stroppy radicals who don't think it is necessarily the most important issue. But I think it's also true. It, it, has, it has, like here, it has become a hugely popular issue for large numbers of people who are not queer. And it has clearly had a huge impact on the discourse. And I'm not going to deny that. 
But I, I would agree with the implication of the question. It has drowned out other issues that some of us think are much more important. Um, I'd like to go back uh, pre-Stonewall and, and get your thoughts on the, the culture that was underground in Bohemia, which many lesbian, when I came to New York in 1960, that's the culture that I became a part of. And that culture was very political in an anti-establishment way. So the politics that came out right after Stonewall, the left had been incredibly homophobic. If it wasn't for the and, the, and even the feminist movement had been incredibly homophobic. So we got a lot of people that came out of the Bohemia world who the left and the right had not made a place for, although we were active in anti war movements, civil rights movements, etc. So at what point, Dennis and, or Chris, do you think that that single issue politic, which was the old homophile politic, um, Took over and took over, you know. And historically, we've seen that in other movements. But at what point and why? And internationally, it doesn't seem they seem to be more radical around the world. Um, Italy, uh, Spain, uh, France, um, even Australia. Up until the current moment, the radical seeds of gay liberation seem to have remained. Where here, they're they're very buried. Can I just go to the last bit of the question? I mean, yes. this is going to sound dreadful, but I've written about four books dealing with all this, and I can't oh, distill it all into... And, and you and I would have a... I mean, not surprisingly, you and I would have a similar take on this. And I just want to go to the last bit, because I think there's a danger of mythologising a, a left radical politics elsewhere. Um, I mean, of the countries you mentioned, they're, they're very different. And, and, I mean, my sense is the French movement is not enormously caught up in the, exactly the same sorts of issues. And, of course, marriage became hugely important symbolic and divisive issue in France. Uh, it brought... I mean, interestingly, it's, it goes against the American perception of France, I think, the biggest street demonstrations in the last decade in France were anti anti gay marriage. Anti and I think more I'm not sure, somebody can correct me, I think it was more to do with adoption mm -hmm. than with marriage. But it has certainly brought out an old you know, remember there's a very strong Catholic right in France as well. Um, look, I think I think it's a really hard question because we're talking about political cultures and political systems. And if you're in Spain, where unemployment is now, what, up to 20%, I suspect, yeah. is that for everyone or just for the young? But certainly, I mean, there's a sense of, of enormous social crisis in a way that there isn't here. Maybe there ought to be, but there isn't. <laughs> So I think that it's a really hard question to give a short answer. I don't know if you want to say anything, but... Uh, no, yeah, yeah. I, you, you know more about these other political cultures than I do. So, uh, and, and Jim knows that, too. I'm, yeah. it's, uh, I'm vaguely aware of the things keep changing. So, uh, I mean, when the anti marriage protest started in France, that took me by Was that based in religion, though? I mean, was it... You talked about the Christian right, but is it... Is, is that... No. Um... I mean, this is one that the, I, I can't answer the question, and I've had long conversations with very, very smart people from France about this. And no, it's, you know, I think there's some really big questions that sometimes we ought to be asking, and, and that would be one. No one in France has ever given me a really good answer, and, and it's a very good question. I and mean, the other one that I think is really interesting is why has. Let's leave aside totally any debate about being for or against marriage. It clearly is a hugely important symbolic step. What I find fascinating is the rapidity with which American public opinion has changed. And I'm certainly not against the fact that it's changed. It would be much better, clearly, if it changes. But it's not just that it's changed about marriage, and that's sort of 
a reflection of other changes, right? And, yeah. I mean, I'm going to ask Chris, is the American here? I, I can't give a simple answer as to what has happened in the past decade where, and we know this from public opinion polls, you know, this is not just street wisdom. Something has shifted dramatically. I think simple fact, it was uh, more and more people have come out. And I, it's, and, and it's, I don't know how you measure that, but more and more people know gay people and they realize, oh, but it's they don't want to talk about that, but they can talk about marriage. Marriage is an yes. easy thing oh, to yes. talk about. But do you think so, uh, gone? No, yeah, that's, yeah, it's, so I, that, because it, but the rapidity is kind of amazing, just how, just quickly, and in, uh, in a, all over the country. See, uh, not, and, I mean, big changes now in the Northeast, yeah. but, uh, but it's happening in other places too. I, I was going to say, have more people, where I think it's important is that more people have come out in popular television shows. Oh. I mean, our perception in Australia is that HBO cannot make a show <laughs> without a perfect lesbian or gay couple, and I think they're still struggling to write the script for the transgender couple, because transgender couples by their nature are complicated to figure out. And I, I'm going to tell a personal story, because actually it's probably in the book, but I love it. Um, my, well, Anthony's nephew, who was then at school, who was last year of a Catholic high school in Sydney, his mother rang Anthony to say, Peter has come out on Facebook at literally the moment Kurt in Glee on our television <laughs> <laughs> is coming out of his dad. So, I don't think, I mean, I think that says something. That's 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 there is a connection that's going to be, yeah, 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 yeah. And I have to say, against what we would have expected, the school behaved extremely well. Everyone behaved, you know, it was just, that's fine. Social media with the youth. Is... And that too, yes. Yeah. Hang on, there maybe somebody hasn't. Uh, okay, and I was just going to say a lot of sports figures in the major now, sports yes. are starting to come out as well. It's, it's, yes. Oh, in the back there? Yeah, I, I wanted to let you know that first of all, my college has recently changed it to so now LGBTIAQNGC to add the intersex allies questioning and non gender conformity. 